Hello, and welcome to the Walrus Talks at Home, my home, your home, youth and the climate crisis, generously supported by the Rossi Foundation. I'm Jennifer Hollett. I am executive director of the Walrus, and we're thrilled to be joining you online this evening, bringing people together from across the country and beyond in conversation live. I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that I'm on. I'm at home right now in downtown Toronto, Ontario, to Toronto. And a land acknowledgement helps us recognize history, thinking about how it informs where we are now and what changes can be made going forward in a commitment to reconciliation. Our offices and where I am right now are located within the bounds of Treaty 13 signed with Mississaugas of the Credit. This land is also the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We're honored to carry on a long tradition of storytelling, and we encourage you to reflect on the land that you're on, wherever you're joining us from today. As part of the ongoing work of reconciliation, if you haven't already done so or done so recently, we encourage you to read the 94 calls to action recommended by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we'll share that link with you now. A bit more about the Walrus. The Walrus is committed to being a platform for Canada's conversation, challenging, urgent, complex, and thoughtful conversations. And we do this in a number of different ways. We're best known for our journalism, which is available in print, but also online at our website, thewalrus.ca, our podcasts, including our new podcast, The Deep Dive, and through our event series like this one. And this work is powered by our donors, our supporters and partners. So thank you all for being a part of this. And again, to the Rossi Foundation for making this event possible. This conversation is part of a larger commitment we have to showcasing a range of voices in Canada. And we're really excited to bring some young leaders together for this event. The Walrus will soon be launching a series of stories as well as a podcast by you. So stay tuned for that. Tonight's topic is a big one, one of the biggest ones, the climate crisis and how it intersects with youth and mental health. Recently, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a report. And when these reports come out, it's like the report. And this outlined that over 40% of the world's population are highly vulnerable to climate. And that number is only growing. The report also explored how our mental health is suffering from the climate crisis. And it confirms something that, that we can feel. I definitely feel it. And this is whether we are witnessing climate changes, whether that be floods, droughts, fires, directly or not. The report also notes that certain groups are more vulnerable, Indigenous communities, farming communities, and youth. We're going to be discussing this and more this evening. Here's how this event works. Each speaker has five minutes live. And once your head is full of new ideas, we'll have a moderated Q&A session with our talkers and you, our audience at home. So if you have a question at any point, feel free to submit it. Just put it in the comments section on Zoom or Facebook Live. And we also encourage you to share this conversation on social media. We'd love to see how you're watching us. Take a screen grab, take a picture, uh, or quote your favorite moments. Tag us at The Walrus on your favorite social media platform. And you can use our hashtag for this event series, hashtag Walrus Talks. Tonight, we'll be hearing from Ashley Consolo, founding dean, School of Arctic and Subarctic Studies, Labrador campus of Memorial University. Nyla Mulo, innovator, the Knowledge Society. Justin Langen, youth advocate and Inspire Award recipient, as well as Tina O, oh, climate justice activist and labor organizer. I'm happy to also say that our speakers are from across Canada. Ashley is in Happy Valley Goose Bay, Nyla is in Ottawa, Justin is in Winnipeg, and Tina is in Halifax. Thanks again for joining us. We're going to kick things off tonight with Ashley Consolo, who's going to tell us more about the idea of ecological grief and help frame our conversation on navigating anxiety and also doing something about the climate crisis. Then we'll hear from our youth leaders and learn more about their incredible work. Over to you, Ashley. 
Hello, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here this evening and to have this important conversation. So I'm Ashley Consolo. I'm the founding dean of the School of Arctic and Subarctic Studies at the Labrador campus of Memorial University. But I'm also a health geographer, and I've been researching the mental health impacts of climate change for almost 15 years. And I'm also deeply affected uh, by the mental health impacts of climate change. So it's a personal interest, and it's also a professional uh, research place that I'm in. So today I'm joining from the ancestral and continued homelands of the Innu and Inuit in Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador. And I'm also joining from a place that really has been at the front lines of a changing climate and environment for decades. And in Labrador and so many other places, climate change is not a distant uh, threat at all. It's a very real present issue that many people are facing. And as one of the, the authors on the mental health content in the IPCC reports, I can tell you that this is not only in Labrador, but it's across Canada and it's around the world. And when we look across the country and when we look around the world, you know, the, the signs of the planetary crisis really are all around us, you know, from floods and fires and droughts and storms and rising sea levels and melting sea ice, changing ecosystems and disappearing species. We really are bearing witness to a rapid and widespread degradation, alteration and loss. And we're surrounded by warnings from the scientific community, we're surrounded by imagery in the media, and we know we're going to continue to face catastrophic loss and damage going forward. So with all of this, with the changes, with the projections, with the ongoing media, with what we know to be our very closing window for action, there are a lot of complicated, difficult, and very real mental and emotional responses that emerge. So things like fear, anger, frustration, sadness, stress, distress, and helplessness. You know, all of those things we hear all the time from, from others and we may experience ourselves. And these changes also exp um, bring feelings of grief and anxiety. And so ecological grief, this grief that we feel to the changes in the environment or ecosystems or wildlife and beloved places and things that matter to us, and ecological anxiety, which is the anxiety we feel when we experience current change, or we think about the change that's coming in the future and what that means for us have really become these dominant emotional responses to climate crisis and have gained increasing attention as these key emotions of our time. And so a lot of the, the questions are, is, you know, what are they and how do we deal with them? So what I wanna talk about tonight is, is things that I've learned about ecological grief and anxiety through my work. And the first and I think the most important is that they are natural, reasonable, rational and emotionally congruent responses to what we are witnessing and experiencing with the climate crisis. There is truly no shame in these emotions and these responses because they make complete sense to what is happening around us. And on that, you know, we really need to acknowledge our grief and anxiety. We need to name them and validate them and then find ways to elevate them so we can move through these emotions and find new ways of balancing our actions and our emotions together. And it's okay that we feel bad. So it might not feel great. These are difficult emotions. These are scary times. But the grief and the anxiety, they break through and they get our attention. And in fact, in many ways, we may even need more of these emotions to deal with the enormity and the severity of what we are facing. And even though they're hard, ecological grief and anxiety really are gifts because they show us what we care about and what we value. And they help us recognize our shared vulnerabilities, both to each other and to the more than human worlds. And connected to that, the other side of ecological grief and anxiety is love. And we can't forget that because we only grieve what we love. And that's where the true power of these emotions come from because they can bring us together and they unite us. And they have what Judith Butler calls an incredible we creating capacity because they create community, they break down boundaries and they bring people together. And so while ecological grief as a term is new, the concept behind it is really old. People have been deeply connected to the environment mentally and emotionally for thousands of years and people and particularly indigenous peoples globally have long understood the interconnectedness of human emotions and natural environments, including grief and loss, but we need new terms to talk about what is happening in these rapidly accelerating times of change. And so, you know, these are difficult emotions, but we can support our experience of ecological grief and anxiety through things that also support overall mental health. So time in nature, exercise, meditation, counseling and therapy, having strong support networks and talking to people you trust and coming together. So really when we're thinking about ecological grief and anxiety, they're difficult and they're hard and they shouldn't be annoyed, they shouldn't be ignored, but they are gifts and they are calls to action. And so there's so much work that needs to be done on the climate crisis 
And while we can't save what has already been lost, we can continue to defend what can still be saved. And that means there's also much grieving work that needs to be done so we can navigate the emotions. And so it's time for action, but it's also time as Thomas Morton proclaimed for grief to persist, to ring throughout the world, and for us to harness our ecological grief into a passion for and dedication to change. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Nyla and I'm a 15 year old really interested in sustainability, currently working on a few projects at the intersection of climate and exponential technologies. I think I first got very interested in climate when I was in grade five, this was my first big point of exposure. And we did a very typical grade five energy project where people were assigned different energy sources. And I looked into geothermal energy. And this was the first time that I realized how pressing climate change was and just how detrimental our global consumption of fossil fuels was. And it was really scary to hear about because not only was climate change affecting the environment, not only is it affecting the environment, but also the economy and our society and everything. And so from there, I knew that I was interested in this space and I was staying up to date with the latest news, but it was towards the end of grade eight that I started noticing a lot more solar panels being put up. And so when I was driving to school or to the mall, I was seeing a lot more solar panels on roofs and in fields. And this was very exciting to me because the, the news was blowing up with climate change. And so I was excited because I thought we were finally making this transition. But then when I dug into the statistics a little bit, I saw that solar energy only made up 3% of our global electricity generation. And that was super disappointing. So I started looking into why this may be, and I noticed this issue of accessibility with solar panels. Because again, you really only do see them on roofs or in fields. But I started thinking about, you know, what if we could have a solar panel on a window or on a car or on a phone screen? What if we could have transparent and flexible solar panels? I started researching this prospect a little bit and it started with some very basic research on how solar panels work and then digging into scientific literature. And from there, um, I started crafting this idea, but I also knew that I was just this 14 year old that I'd been researching this for a few months. And there were people out there with way more experience than me, years and years of experience. It was a little bit intimidating, but then I realized that, you know, why not just reach out to them? And so I got on LinkedIn and I would just reach out to a bunch of people like the CEOs and CTOs at sustainable energy companies and I would ask them for a 15 minute call just to get feedback on my ideas. And from there, not only did I start to have this solution, but it was validated by experts in the field. And so that's one product that I'm working on this transparent and flexible solar panel. But I kind of took that framework of doing research and networking, just following my curiosity a little bit. And I applied it to another really big world problem today which is plastic pollution. And we all know that plastics are an enormous problem, but I started looking at solutions to plastic pollution. And one of these solutions is bioplastics. Bioplastics are essentially bio-based versions of plastics today. So our plastics come from coal and oil and other fossil fuels, but bioplastics come from crops like corn and sugarcane and potatoes. So it's a lot better than the status quo, but I also notice this problem that if we're using a bunch of crops that humans need to consume, especially with climate change, and we're putting these towards materials, then you know, what about the people who need to eat these crops? So I started researching second generation aquatic feedstocks, which are crops that grow in water and that humans don't consume. And I came across duckweed in my research. And again, well, that's a very strange sounding species, but it's essentially just a very cool second generation aquatic feedstock. And I started reaching out to people once again. I reached out to the CEO of this company called Pond Bio Materials, and I started working with them over the summer. And so I'm still working with them. They're based in Denmark, and I've been doing some experimentation in a local university lab. But these are just a few projects that I'm working on right now. And I think that it's so important that we're having this conversation because 
youth do need to be involved in this discussion about climate change. If we think about it, the next generation is going to be the most impacted by this. And so it makes sense that they're also going to be the most integral with helping craft these innovative solutions to combat this crisis. Thank you so much. And I'm excited for the panel to follow. Hi, everyone. My name is Justin Langan. Um, so I'm in Winnipeg right now, but I come from the rural community of Swan River. Um, I was raised there and it's a part of my identity. And whenever I speak on whether it be mental health or environmentalism, I always come back to my identity and my um, lived experience in this rural community. Um, so that's where, where I got my start um, in terms of being an environmental advocate, an indigenous, indigenous advocate. Um, so I started in the community having conversations with other youth, not just indigenous youth, but non-indigenous youth at a community level, understanding more about how the environment is changing. Um, when I speak on environment um, and climate change, um, I always settle on some pillars, um, networking, communication, and information that is consumable for the average um, Canadian, especially rural Canadians and Indigenous Canadians. Um, because, you know, statistics are nice, but really for the average Canadian who lives in a rural area like I do, seeing is really, there's truth in that. Um, so my conversations really surround um, understanding how the environment is changing in simple, small ways, whether it be, I'd be speaking to hunters and gatherers and trappers and fishermen who have seen, you know, the effects of climate change over the years um, on sp different species that have gone, that have come invasive species and really talking with them and understanding their own perspective, especially an indigenous perspective, um, I think is important because one of the biggest projects I've done so far has been you know, speaking with elders in surrounding communities in the Parkland region here in Manitoba, um, very small communities, rural, northern communities that, you know, don't get a lot of attention. <clears throat> so I'd go to these elders' houses, I'd come to their community, and I just talk with them, talk about their life, talk about what they've lived through, and talk about their experience, their experience with climate change and how it's affected them in their community. Um, one example I always like to say is I went to the community of Duck Bay. Um, I talked to Elizabeth and Gloria. <clears throat> now, years ago, Duck Bay used to be a thriving community. Um, lots of people there. And, you know, I'd say 30 years ago, they'd go up to Kettle Hills, it's called. It's near Swan River, where I live. And, you know, the families would go there. They'd pick berries, blueberries. They used, they used to be luscious, big, everywhere, plentiful. Um, elders would go there, young people, pick berries, pick medicine. And as the years went on, you know, these elders told me they noticed how the berries got smaller, they became more scarce. And this community tradition of going, you know, up to Kettle Hill to pick berries, it got lost. And with that, the community got lost, you know, with urbanization. More Indigenous people are leaving these communities. And, you know, that's just one example in the small community of Duck Bay, where, you know, this one activity has been ruined forever. Um, and they told me this with, uh, you know, tears in their eyes, because it affected them so much. And it's these, you know, that we don't really see, these stories that we don't really see on a national scale in these conversations about climate change, that it's just so simple for, you know, this community, and it's lost now. Um, so in my conversation, that's what I really gathered and I wanted to bring home is that <clears throat> changes happen on a community level. And it's up to young people like me to help stir these conversations in the community. So when I talk to fellow youth, I always say, you know, you wanna make change. You know, climate change can be this big, scary thing. How do we even start on this? Um, I always say start at the community level, have conversations, um, not just among other youth, but with the old people, you know, with the elders, with people who are sort of skeptical, 
and have these conversations and this dialogue that can help change minds. And once you start changing minds, you can help start affecting change, whether it be creating a community group that can help pick up garbage or you know, talk to the local newspaper and help put out a new story. Those are simple ways you, know, you can make change in your community and help share these stories that need to be shared. So thank you. Hi folks, uh, my name is Tina Yangju Oh. I am tuning in from Halifax, Nova Scotia, the unceded, the unsurrendered, and the continued future forever territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation. I'm speaking today from my positionality as a first generation immigrant settler, as an organizer for the labor union movement, as well as in the movement for migrant justice. We often don't consider labor justice or migrant justice as foundational components to a climate just world, but the utter reality is that these movements for a compassionate, healthy and dignified planet for all people are inherently intertwined. About four months ago, I was in Glasgow, Scotland, attending COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Negotiations. I was there as a trainer supporting and amplifying the work of Black and Indigenous youth from so-called Canada and their communities. It was my fourth set of negotiations and it was by far one of the most challenging spaces that I had ever been in. And something that I've noticed as again, this was my fourth set of negotiations is that as the climate crisis worsens, as the climate crisis worsens, so do the state of these negotiations. I think frankly, what made these negotiations so challenging was the sheer normalcy of business as usual. Greta Thunberg called it a North American greenwashing festival. The largest delegation present at the conference were delegates from oil and gas companies. Essentially, the fossil fuel industry, big oil, had more seats than the United Kingdom government who was hosting the conference. So what does that tell us? Who's actually hosting this conference? Corporations with the biggest seats at the table are some of the world's wealthiest and have major assets to protect and profit to make. And so a question that I had during these negotiations were, are these negotiations actually about a safe and livable planet? Or is it about maintaining power and wealth for the very few elite as well as their corporations that have a lot to lose when faced with the prospect of a zero carbon world by 2050? So I found myself in another continent just absolutely horrified at the progression of these United Nations negotiations, which are to this day one of the only tools that the world has that binds the countries together to address the climate crisis and the catastrophes that have come and are yet to come. And year after year, I've seen that these negotiations are losing their efficacy. Even the most modest steps forward get watered down year after year after year. At the same time, in spite of this horrific lack of action from the top, there wasn't a single moment that I felt defeated. I was horrified, I was anxious, and honestly, I think in many ways I was grieving, but to talk about whether or not I was defeated, I can confidently say that I, I did not feel that at all. And the reason being is because I saw so much incredible resistance, more than ever before, whether they were inside the negotiation space or whether they were outside. And it was ordinary people, working people, young people, indigenous leaders and elders, young people, environmentalists and their organizations saying, enough is enough with business as usual. Now, one of the prominent narratives with this recent negotiation has been to push net zero. And we're starting to hear that kind of everywhere. Big corporations like Coca-Cola are committing to net zero. Apple, Silicon Valley giants, they're committing to net zero. And the reality is that net zero doesn't actually mean zero emissions. Net zero means that they're gonna continue business as usual, but instead they're gonna plant a few trees in you know, X country or buy off or trade carbon credits, and that will ultimately make it to net zero. So again, the resistance that I saw was people resisting this message. People were saying, we don't want your net zero branding scheme. Net zero doesn't actually mean real zero. And people were saying, listen to the science, listen to the ancestral knowledge of the indigenous peoples who have been stewarding the world's lands. Indigenous resistance is protecting 80% of the global biodiversity of this planet. It is far more effective than any bureaucratic global negotiations that invites fossil fuel industry to the table. So back to when I said that I wasn't defeated, how could I be when so much life-affirming resistance was occurring everywhere around me? 
It goes without saying that the people leading this incredible resistance were Indigenous and frontline people from all over the world. The people who are the most impacted by climate change were sharing stories, knowledge, and speaking power to what it means to interrupt and intervene in these inadequate spaces. To kind of cap it off there, the biggest lesson I've learned in organizing for the labor movement, the climate movement, and the migrant justice, migrant justice movement is shifting my thinking to one of scarcity to one of abundance. Capitalism makes us think that we're inadequate. It makes us think that we're living in perpetual scarcity. It manufactures scarcity thinking that there's never enough money, that there's not enough room in this country to allow migrants, that there's not enough time to act on the climate crisis. But the reality is that we live in a world of abundance. Yes, we're living in a time of crisis, but there is ultimately more than enough, more than enough space for everyone at the table. There is abundance of work being done, even as I speak, of people in every corner of the earth doing their part. I saw that in Glasgow, and as Justin said, he's seeing the solutions come from the community. It's hard to feel defeated if we acknowledge the gratitude of abundance. We have enough time, not a lot of time, to take action, but we do have time, and we need to do something about it, and we have to believe, and we ultimately have to act, because no one else will. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina O. Oh, before Tina, we heard from Justin Langan, Nyla Mudo, and Ashley Consolo. Wow, <laughs> I am excited to open up this conversation. To our audience tuning in from home, we wanna know, where are you joining us from? Today, tonight, let's take a look. We have audience members registered from all over, including Anchorage, hello, Red Deer, Santa Fe, what's up? Truro, wow, this is great. Thank you for sharing with us where you're based. A reminder, if you have a question for our talkers, please submit it on Zoom in the chat or if you're watching on Facebook Live in the comments. Now I'd like to invite all of our talkers to turn on their cameras and come back to the online stage. Uh, wow, so much to cover. Welcome back. Uh, I'd like to start, Ashley, with the emotions, and thanks for naming it and saying that they're normal and they're reasonable. I felt that was very validating. But to build on something that you tapped into, are we upset enough about the climate crisis? And I don't mean the audience or the people on this call, but is there enough outrage globally right now? Well, I think there's plenty of outrage globally. And I think, you know, Tina did a wonderful job of talking about that, that there's this huge resistance continuing on. And so I think it's it's not that we need more outrage because that's there. You know, people are, we, we are in crisis, people are in rage. I think it's about tapping into things that can bring us together in different sorts of ways. And that's actually what I find incredibly powerful about like grief and anxiety. And so, you know, I suffer from being furious all the time and there's this like endless political rage that I go through, but I actually find that drains me incredibly. But when I'm able to tap into the grief and the other types of emotions that come from there and the love, and also I love the abundance piece that Tina brought in there. And that's what grief is showing us. Like there is this love and abundance and that's where I feel the fuel. That's where I find the resistant hope, the gritty hope. So I think we need more of that. And I think we're, you know, they're hard emotions, but we need to figure out how to embrace them and how to move through them and how to talk about them because they are, you know, these natural responses. Like we, if we're not curled up in a ball because of what is happening to the planet around us, you know, there's something wrong. So it's actually flipping it around and saying, yes, we should be grieving and we potentially should be grieving a lot more, but we have to find out how to support each other in the grieving process so that we don't become immobilized and instead we can move through together. Well, to Tina and Justin and Nyla, what are some of the feelings you're navigating in this work? Let's start with Tina. Uh, yeah, Jennifer, big question. I, I, it's a range of emotions. It's the fear, it's the anger, it's the, you know, it's the vulnerability. And at the same time, it's just this awe inspiring, just, you know, like it just, I, I, there's no words to even put it just, for example, the experience that I was sharing of kind of witnessing that, it, that resistance in Glasgow and being there, it just, it brings kind of chills to my body because it's, I think it's moments like that where 
it ultimately brings you deeper and deeper into the movement to this point where I can't imagine not ever working in, in part of this movement. Um, so I think more importantly too, is that we need to do these things collectively. Um, and ultimately those are, the collective piece is gonna be what makes it easier for us to move through those very difficult emotions and that fear is being able to lean on each other and get the support that way. So definitely, um, you know, as you were asking your question, Jennifer, is, um, you know, faces came to my mind. It was the people who support me, the people who are on the ground with me, who are actively resisting this together. They are the people that are going me, keeping me through. Mm, that's the power of community. Justin. Yeah, so, you know, it's easy to become angry, you know, about what's happening, governmental responses to it. Um, but I feel like the biggest feeling I've had over these past few years have been understanding. Um, understanding that not everyone can think the way you think. Um, and that, you know, it's important to have conversations with um, people that disagree with you, that agree with you, you know, so you can have a solution. Um, going to communities has just been, you know, an entire world of understanding, of um, new youth understanding more about the climate crisis, um, me understanding their stories and understanding that, you know, there's skepticism in a lot of, you know, the people I talk to about solutions we can have to these issues. And really, you know, it all comes down to a conversation for me, just talking with them and hopefully coming to a solution by the end of that conversation. So, yeah. Thank you. Nyla, what are some of the emotions for you in this work? Yeah, well, I think climate change itself can be very anxiety inducing. And it is definitely something that's, that's super stressful because right now it's a very, very pressing problem that needs solutions. But I also think that through kind of doing my research, I've seen that there are so many solutions. Like there are so many people kind of coming up with these technologically driven innovations to address climate change. And I've seen things not only in energy, but also like in agriculture, I've seen cellular agriculture and new technologies like, I don't know, quantum dots for solar panels to enhance their efficiency, things like this, that's really exciting to me. And so I think that we are recognizing that climate change is the biggest existential threat that we are facing and we do need solutions. And there are a lot of solutions. Like there's so many promising things coming out now, like companies that are already in the space, products that are being developed, like fusion energy, I think is so exciting. And so I am also just excited to see the landscape 10 years down the line, because I think it is going to be so different. And there are so many people working on this, like people in this call. Thank you, Justin. I want to come back to the power of conversation at the Walrus. We aim to be Canada's conversation, uh, but specifically the piece on talking to people who maybe you disagree with or, or people who are not on board. Can you tell me more about those conversations, how you welcome them and what you're hearing from people who aren't in the choir? Because that's something I worry about with certain movements, right? That we're all violently agreeing with each other. So I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, um, so, you know, in a lot of advocacy, I've noticed over my years um, being involved with it, a lot of it, um, a lot of it is in more urban settings, right? And it's it's easy to, you know, kind of be in a bubble of hearing certain perspectives. And I feel like coming from a rural community, being raised there, hearing completely different perspectives that have been, you know, said over the years, rather than in urban centers, has just been my responsibility to bring that viewpoint to the table, even if I don't agree with it, there are people in these communities that don't believe in climate change. They don't believe in you know certain changes. They think it's a hoax. Um, so really, it's those conversations that I welcome, <clears throat> because as I said, you know, you know some of these people who think climate change is a hoax, you start talking with them, and maybe they're hunters, and you can talk about okay, you know, you started hunting twenty years ago. What have you noticed? And they start talking, you know, certain species have left, 
you know, more invasive species have come and then they start thinking about it like, wait a minute, okay, I'm noticing a change happening here. So as long as you have this conversation, like and you're open to it, I'm always open to a conversation. Um, even if by the end of it, their mind is not changed, at least they're thinking about something different. And really <clears throat> that's the key of it. Going into these rural communities and bringing in a new perspective that can sort of change their mind in some aspect, that's a win for me, you know, in terms of having a conversation. So, yeah. Yeah, incredible listening. Uh, Tina, this issue is political. You're involved with so many different movements. How do you connect the dots and not get overwhelmed? Because I, I thought at the beginning of COVID, like maybe this is going to prompt it. Maybe people are going to see, okay, we need to take action on climate. Look what we're dealing with. The next thing is climate. Whereas I think a lot of people are just like, oh gosh, there's so much going on right now. Ukraine, this, right? the list goes on. So how do you connect the movements you're involved with and not feel overwhelmed? Sounds like you feel actually quite inspired. Yes, and, and Jennifer, I think that's, that's the interesting piece is that to me, I think learning about how the climate crisis connects to so many, essentially everything in our life, um, our identities and the cultures that we belong to and um, our, our citizenship, it, it, it ultimately does impact everything. And so um, to me, it's not a sense of overwhelm, but rather it falling into place, understanding the bigger picture. Um, a big kind of point that I was trying to make too is that the climate crisis, I mean, as you said, Jennifer, it's political. When people are displaced from, a, from their home due to a disaster that could have been avoided, that's very political. And when people become associated with identifiers like refugees and migrants in a country that doesn't afford them basic rights because of a climate disaster that pushed them out of their homes, again, that's very political. So I think when we start to understand what the root causes of the climate crisis are, which is this deep inequality, this deep colonialization and imperialism across the world, um, that's when we start to see the picture starting to fall in place and the bigger picture starts to become much more clear. So I think for me, understanding the different webs and how they're all connected has, has allowed me to uh, commit more intensely to the movements. Um, and as I said, I you know, my paid job is in the labor movement, my community work is in migrant justice, and ultimately, I consider all of that to be environmental work, um, because of the fact that it is all connected. So I think at the same time, it, it goes to show too that the people um, who are doing their hardest, doing their tactics, working on the cl climate change front, is we need them there. There are tactics and tools in the toolbox and we need all of them and we need people where they are. So I think, um, you know, wherever it is that you can plug into, that's the right place for you to be um, and to, yeah, and to connect them together ultimately because this is the collective work. Yeah. Nyla, listening to your story, I was just, you know, so impressed that you saw something you mentioned you were disappointed finding out that solar energy is just 3% worldwide, but you decided to take action. What advice do you have for anyone who isn't sure how to like turn an idea into action? Because I think that can be the hard part for people is where do you begin? And I, I would love to hear from your experience what you tell people. Yeah, I mean, I think climate change can be overwhelming. So if you're like, I want to go and build a project in climate change, you know, what does that really mean? Because it's so big, it encompasses so much. But I feel like it all just starts with curiosity. Um, and then from there, exposure. So if you are interested in the energy space, for example, and you're interested in a specific energy source, like, I don't know, fusion energy, then starting to look more into that and just follow your curiosity. If you know it's something that you're interested in, you know, start going deeper into that and building real projects. I feel like climate change as a whole is really, really big. But then as you start going deeper and into more specificity, then that's when it can get easier to start coming up with your own projects and, and reaching out to people within these specific fields. Even if you're 
you're interested in this space in general and you're interested in the energy space and you don't know where to start, you can also just talk to people. I have been really surprised about just how welcoming and supportive people are. Like I would just reach out to literally people who had no idea who I was and I'd ask them for 15 to 20 minutes of their time because their work was super inspirational to me. And they'd say, yes, they just give me their time. And these are people in very executive roles who are super busy, but they're excited to see youth working in in these similar fields. And so I think using people to your advantage as well and realizing that you're not alone in this and there are people that you can reach out to. Then also just really just following your curiosity, um, starting to build projects. And as you do come up with your own ideas, getting that validation from people who have more expertise in that field um, and understanding that asking for help is completely okay. I'm hearing experiment, right? And find the fun in experimenting. Yeah, follow your curiosity. All right, thanks to the audience for submitting comments and questions. I'm gonna to get to some of them now. Emily asks, what message would any of you give to the next generation about climate change and ecological anxiety? Ashley, since it's uh, your area of, of study and expertise, uh, curious what, what you share in, in terms of the next generation. And then we'll also chat with Justin and Tina and, and Nyla in terms of what, what you say to your peers. Yeah, well, and I would also like to speak to my peers and yeah, older you're generations right. Open as well, it up. because hmm. this, this is actually something I think the ecological grief and anxiety is something that is creating intergenerational conversations in very different ways than we've seen before. And in particular, I think it's the youth generations that are pushing uh, older generations, such as myself and beyond, to actually talk about this more because, you know, I've been researching this for almost 15 years and people were barely talking about it. You know, up until about five years ago, we see a huge upswell all around the globe, particularly driven by young people saying, you know, like we've had enough, something needs to change. Not only are we angry, we're also incredibly sad and incredibly anxious, but we're not gonna let that stop us, but we need to have conversations about it. So I actually think that this is a conversation for all of us and it can actually bring people together to talk about it. And, and I find, like, I think again, you know, I'll go back to these are natural, reasonable, rational responses. So take strength in that, you know, find hope in that, come together, talk with people, but also don't be afraid. Like if you are struggling, you know, don't be afraid to reach out and find ways to connect and get that support because we all need assistance sometimes. And, you know, if you're working, you know, in the, in the climate area, in any justice area, it is hard and it's difficult. If you're seeing images, if you've experienced the front lines of climate change, you know, reach out, but have these conversations, you know, and I, I you know, I'll keep going back to what Justin said, have these conversations with all generations, because this is a global conversation for all of us. Tina. Yeah, I think something that I would say to the next generation about climate change and anxiety is that uh, there is enough time um, it is not too late. And that if you and I, and we work together, we can do this. Um, and I think also what's really important coming from different movements such as labor and migrant justice too, is that we can take notes from other successful movements. And we know that winning is possible. And it, you know, kind of the, the formula to do, to, to do that is if we break down the silos of our collective struggles, if we use them to build empathy, forge relationships and solidarity, we can win. And what I love is we can take notes and share notes, right? Because as you described, when you bring people to the table, then you can work side by side. Justin. Yes, so um, I speak to a lot of Indigenous youth um, in round circles, and really it's been tough dealing with inter intergenerational traumas, colonialism, and now we're dealing with ecological anxiety. Um, but, you know, a lot of the stress comes from, <clears throat> you know, wanting to make change in the world, but climate change is such a big issue. Where do you even begin? Um, so what I just say is start small, you know, don't expect to change the world in a day. Um, start in your community, start at a local level. Um, and, you know, have conversations. Again, it goes back for me to conversations, because really, if you start at a community level and you could help change the dialogue and the understanding of what climate change is and how you can change it within your own community, you know, 
that I call that a success because you know it's a global issue, right? But at the end of the day, it starts in the community. And yeah, that's what I'd say. Great, Nyla. Yeah, just kind of iterating what on what other people have said. I think that climate change is a very collective movement and everybody does have their own part to play. And so that could be like, if you're interested in climate and you wanna start doing research and start going into the science behind it, you know, that's definitely one potential way to go. But like, there are so many different things that you can do. I think everyone on this call is like also kind of approaching climate change in a very different way, which is really cool. And so it could even just be like reaching out to your local MP. You don't have to work full time in the climate space to be doing your part. And so I think just also staying up to date with the latest news, keeping yourself well researched within the space because it is super important to know about um, and just, just realizing that we all do have responsibility. Yeah, and I also always think about how movements are driven by people and always need more people. So it actually can be helpful if you say, oh gosh, I'm overwhelmed or I don't know what to do because someone's gonna hear you and say, hey, <laughs> come to this or can you bring the tofu dogs or you could, right? Like there's an opportunity just by sharing those emotions uh, that <laughs> one of the uh, uh, organizers or activists here or in their networks would say like, hey, come to this talk or here's something that you, that you can do. Cause that is the good news. There's a lot that can be done. Another audience question, this is from Mark, and I'm going to direct it to Tina based on your intersectional work. How will we deal with the migrant crisis that will develop due to the pillaging of resources from the most populous and poorest regions when they become too hot to live in? Um, so yes, this is a question obviously that I've dedicated much of my organizing to thinking about. Um, and ultimately the, the reason why I've, I've shifted most of my gears towards climate justice, you know, focus to, to migrant justice focus, um, is essentially kind of related to the question that Mark asked. Um, I think statistically, um, on average, there's 26 million people displaced by a climate related disaster every single year. That's one person forced to flee every second, that every second. Um, and that was a statistic back in 2016. So no doubt has that number increased in the past five years. Um, the reality I think for me is, is that when we think about, and I'll just give an example because I think that might help, is that when we saw the caravan, the migrant caravan come from Latin America to the United States border, the reason that we, the, the, the pinpoint that we didn't actually look at is the, is the fact as to why people were fleeing places like Honduras and El Salvador and Guatemala. And the reason being is because those regions were facing the worst drought that they've ever had in history. There physically is no water, there is no land to grow food. And these are indigenous communities that have been attacked um, throughout decades by governments and corporations based in Canada. 75% of the world's mining corporations are based in Canada, 75% of the world's corporations. There is a reason why those corporations chooses to base their, their companies in places like Canada. And it is because the government allows for, you know, horrific things to happen in places in lands not within Canadian borders. So I think, again, Mark, this is a question that's so deep and it's so interconnected to so many different areas and politics and, and factors. But the reality is, is that when we fight for climate justice, we also need to make sure that when climate migrants are displaced from their home, that there is a place that will welcome them. And so the work that I think we, especially in Canada, have to do just by the fact that, you know, of where we're geographically located is that we have to make our communities more welcoming and more tolerant of a variety of different people. And we need to ensure that when they do come to these borders, that they will have every right and freedom that every other Canadian has. Uh, because today that's not happening. We have migrants that do not have the basic rights that we do. Um, and so ultimately that is the biggest mountain that we will have. And there's so many mountains to climb and, and to move, but um, yeah, ultimately I think the work too is how can we fight against these systems of racism and, and xenophobia 
and how does that relate to the climate crisis? Thank you so much. I want to get to a couple more audience questions. Nyla, I'm going to direct this one to you. It's from Eric, who is curious about the implications of the rising costs of alternative energy and what that might mean for the financial future of young people. I'm just curious, as you're researching all alternatives, uh, what can you say about, about costs? Um, I think costs are actually going down on renewable energies. Obviously, that, that fluctuates, but because there is such a large demand and that's growing for these sustainable energies, we're seeing things like solar energy and wind energy really being driven down in cost. Um, and that's changed a lot just over the past five years. Like solar energy was a lot more expensive. And now because there's so much more production, the, the cost is decreasing. Um, and so there, there are a few like, issues with the cost of renewable energies because sometimes when you have such a low cost with renewable energies companies actually don't see like the incentive to to selling it because it's too low and so that's that's been interesting to to read about because then some companies are actually complaining about solar energy being too cheap and I read that and I was like you know we we want <laughs> we want renewable energies to be cheap and then when we get there, then there are people complaining about it being too cheap. And so there is definitely um, a lot going on with that side of, of energy. And it's something that I'm not like super, super well versed in. It's obviously things that I've come across within my research, but there are some contradictory uh, kind of views there with regards to the price of renewable energy. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question that I'm feeling others are wondering too. It's from Anne. It's Justin going to publish his observations of his conversations? Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Anne. Um, so as we speak, I'm still interviewing elders. Um, you know, I really started it in 2019. Um, and then due to COVID uh, pandemic, I, I wanted to keep the elders safe. So, you know, yeah. left them alone at that moment. Um, but really, we're starting up again. I'm going to Swan River um, tomorrow, actually, and we're going to start interviewing more elders. And hopefully, by the end of the year, these conversations will be uploaded and everyone will be able to read them. So, yeah. Let us know. We'd be happy to share those. I, I think you've really captured our imagination and possibility with the power of conversation. As we wrap up, we'd love just to hear one or two words from each of you on the emotions you're feeling right now, being in conversation, talking about these things out, out loud. Ashley, what emotions do you leave tonight with? Uh, I feel incredibly inspired and privileged and I feel a lot of hope and not sort of a, a Pollyanna hope, but a real gritty hope from the work that we're all doing together and the work that countless people out there are doing and that we're having these conversations gives me endless energy and, and gratitude. Thank you, Tina. Um, I'm feeling a lot of abundance. I'm feeling a lot of power. Um, I think, you know, something that is just so powerful to hear is just stories from people doing the work. There is an abundance of work being done. We just need to amplify and, and see that. Thank you. Nyla. Yeah, I'm also definitely feeling inspired and optimistic. I love having these conversations and I think they're, they're so important. So I love this as well. And thank you so much for having me. And Justin. I feel encouraged. As you know, I bet, you know, I love conversations. So having this conversation has really helped uh, broaden my mindset, you know, and I'm especially glad to be here and talk with everyone. So thank you. Thank you. Devin Chat says that she feels inspired by all of you as well. And Elizabeth says cautiously optimistic. So appreciate the, the honesty. I think we can all relate to that. Thanks again to our talkers, Ashley Consolo, Nala Mulu, Justin Langan, and Tina O. Oh. To our audience at home, thank you for joining us. And uh, we have more coming up starting this Thursday at noon Eastern time. Join us for the Walrus Leadership Forum, Technology and Treatment. This is presented by Brain Canada. And the event will explore emerging solutions for the mental health challenges of Canadians. So that really builds on the conversation we just had. Check in with us at the walrus.ca slash events. You can browse our schedule. You can register for upcoming events that are of interest. We also post videos 
from all of our events, including this one in the Walrus Talks video room on our website. Also, keep an eye on your inbox. We're going to send you an email as a follow up. If you'd like to attend future events like this one and stay in touch with the Walrus and see what we're working on, please sign up and opt into our newsletter in that email. And then coming up at the end of the month on March 30th, tune into our live stream of the Walrus Talks Energy at Globe Forum 2022 in Vancouver, where our speakers will discuss how Canada can create an emissions-free economy. Uh, we also have more announcements coming up as we start returning to in-person events. We would love to see your face. The Walrus is a unique animal. We're a registered charity that produces award-winning journalism, events, and podcasts. And we do this through the support of our community of donors and sponsors. So if you enjoyed tonight's event, which was free, consider making a donation. Just visit our website at thewalrus.ca, click on donate, and all gifts of $20 or more will receive a charitable tax receipt. Thanks again to the Rossi Foundation for their generous support of our initiatives for youth by youth. Thank you to our annual sponsors, Air Canada, Inspire, Labat Breweries of Canada, Meta and Shaw. Community, as we discussed, is so important as it relates to the climate crisis, but also these long COVID times. And each one of you is part of the Walrus community. Thanks again for being a part of this. Merci, miigwech, and have a great evening.